So how's the uh, how, how, how's the working from home working out for you? Yeah, yeah, I I, uh, I miss the office too. Yeah, all right. Well, may the fourth be with you. Uh, may the fourth be with you. May the fourth. Never mind. How do you not know this? How do you not know this? Uh, hey. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 18, Niagara 411 Live with Lee Sterry. That would be me. We are fueled by Gale's Gas Bars. We are uh, technologically supported, created by WeStream, Canada's first and foremost streaming company. Also, we are supported by Performance Heating and Air, Verge Insurance Group. And uh, we do the show from this uh, lovely location at 149 St. Paul Street. Tasty location as well, Fiddler's Poor House. So, come on in. Uh, and may the fourth be with you. Uh, feel free to join us uh, in on that, by the way. Uh, some, some big things happen today. Uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominees list was uh, announced. We'll get into that. Also, we've had her on the show before, and uh, she is just uh, one, one of Niagara's huge claims to fame director, documentary director uh, Natalie B. Bow is going to be joining us. She has a brand new video being released on Amazon Prime coming up on uh, Friday. And she is going to be talking to us about that, a long, long, long unsolved cold case. And uh, we'll be talking more about that with Natalie at about 12.45. All right, and uh, a few other surprises coming up in the program. We'll see you in about 30 seconds. Thanks. And here we go. Season 3, episode 18 of Niagara 411 Live with Lee Sterry. And uh, this is probably one of the, I don't know, dullest, deadest kind of days. Is it just me? Or is it just, it just sort of feels like the day is, I don't know, just laying there. Um, this is a special day for us, uh, being on a Wednesday. And uh, Kevin Jack, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on the right-hand uh, side of your screen, uh, this is getting into a busy season, God bless, for, uh, for WeStream. They have a lot of things, that, and unfortunately, they have not, or nobody has yet, figured out how to be in two places at once. So uh, every now and then, we shift this show around because uh, we are a little bit more flexible with this program than other people are with maybe their events. And uh, Kevin had a bit of a conflict tomorrow. And of course, I get second billing, so he's got to go you know, where the money is. And uh, you know what? Because I don't pay him. Lee, uh, parents of young children will be hearing about this all <laughs> next week. We're working alongside uh, the MPCA, the Niagara Region, and we're live streaming some of the events for the Niagara Children's Water Festival. So they'll learn awesome. not just about water preservation, but um, but also just all things green and all things environmental. So Yeah, terrific. Yeah, so we're happy to be brought on board for that. Terrific. And uh, it's been a relatively, in some ways, a quiet week. And in some ways, that's a good thing uh, because there haven't been there haven't been a lot of tragedies for us to uh, to report on this week and delve into, and uh, and that's a good thing, thank goodness, because no, but I don't know that anybody has lost their livelihood this week that we're aware of on Niagara 411. By the way, thanks to Niagara 411, uh, its uh, creator and uh, maintainer Nick, for uh, for being here. Nick's mom, thank you. Uh, happy Mother's Day to Nick's mom to uh, Kevin's mom and uh, every other mom on the planet. It's gonna be a big weekend. And uh, anybody that has a mom, be you, be you younger or older or whatever, your mom doesn't uh, really need flowers, she doesn't need chocolate, she doesn't need nothing, all she needs is you. Uh, so, so call your mama, <laughs> okay? Um, isn't, that, isn't that interesting that uh, and I've thought this for, I don't know, decades, forever. Mother's Day, moms want, want everybody around. They just want their kids there. Father's Day, 
let me get out of the house. <laughs> very, very, very different psychological uh, approaches to those days. Anyway, call your mama. Tell her you're okay. Tell her you love her, and uh, and because that's really all she wants. You don't need to spend a lot of money. Just uh, just let her know that you know that she's there. All right. That's what moms really want. Um, Kevin, does your let me ask you this. My wife is kind of a, a, an interesting person in this vein. Um, she doesn't care if I recognize Mother's Day at all. Because she says, y y y I'm not your mother. <laughs> I said, well, you got a point there. So I I'm, I'm kind of off the hook when it comes to Mother's Day. It's her kids that are on, that, that are on the hot seat as far yeah. as she's concerned. Our children are still so young, Lee, that they need a lot of hand-holding. But i got to say, well, of ahead course. of the game, Monday we went out and did our Mother's Day shopping. So it's all done. It's all Excellent. in the bag. And we're ready to go come Sunday. But uh, happy Mother's Day to my beautiful wife, Leanne. And I'm Absolutely. going to be seeing my mom, uh, Joan. They're coming to visit uh, overnight nice. Friday into Saturday. And, nice. Lee, a couple of big tickets that I'm going to tomorrow night. I get to go just across the road to the Performing Arts Center and go see John Cleese. He had his first show oh, last night, second one tomorrow, and then Friday night, I'm at the Avalon Ballroom to take in ZZ Top, and you saw Rock Show on Monday. Yeah, I'm so jealous of you, though. We saw, we saw a cover band called Pigs, uh, which is a cover band of, uh, of Pink Floyd, the, a band formed in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, in 2008, and man, were these, were these people spectacular. If, uh, if you were a Pink Floyd fan, note, note, note perfect, the whole thing. So it was really, really good. And that uh, Partridge Hall, what a great place to see a show. Yeah, I'm really um, looking forward to it. John yeah. Cleese, I, I told my buddy we're going for dinner ahead of time, and I said I'll be silly walking the whole way there. And the top, geez, I'm so jealous of you, Texas Blues. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to, uh, to see how, how ZZ Top does without Dusty. Because uh, he passed away, of course, last last year. Yeah. So they're down. Yeah. They're down. Well, they're, one of the guys they're down the beard. one beard. Yeah. But they still have the drummer, whose last name is Beard, who does not have a beard. Yes. But you know what? I mean, if you are interested, because I looked it up, and uh, the guy that is now replacing Dusty on stage was like the fourth member of the band. He's been with them for 30, 35 years. He would often do some of the background mixing and uh, and guitar work, like yeah. you know, side stage. So now he's. You know, center stage. Musically, musically, I'll bet you won't notice a lick, pardon the pun, no. worth a difference. Now, uh, speaking, speaking of music, exactly. <laughs> um, the announcement came out today from Cleveland, uh, Ohio, which of course is the home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And uh, the inductees were announced today and well they can do it better than uh, than we can do it so here's here's just a little piece of the video that they put up about uh, the inductees to this year's uh, rock and roll hall of fame ceremony participated in the fan vote and now here is the 2022 class of rock and roll hall of fame inductees in the performers category pat benatar duran duran Eminem, Eurythmics, Dolly Parton, Lionel Richie, and Carly Simon. Oh, I love her. In addition, <laughs> we're honored to induct the following in these special categories. Judas Priest, Jimmy Jam, and Terry Lewis for musical excellence. Alan Grubman, Jimmy Iovine, and Sylvia Robinson as our Amit Erdogan awardees, Elizabeth Cotton, and Harry Belafonte for early influence. Wow. Congratulations to our newest inductees and welcome to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're excited to celebrate with you on Saturday, November 5th in Los Angeles. Visit rockhall.com and follow us in social media to hear about ticket on sale dates and details about this year's induction ceremony. Very, very cool. Um, the one, the one standout in that in that list is Dolly Parton because there was a lot of hoopla about that when she was nominated to be a member uh, of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and Dolly Parton said, "Thank you very much for thinking of me." 
But I am not uh, a rock and roller. I am a country artist. And maybe one day I'll be able to release an album that in my mind would qualify in that category. But I don't believe I do qualify in that category. So I, I would appreciate it if you didn't induct me into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, Kevin, Dolly Parton is a pretty popular, pretty powerful woman uh, and a lovely lady to boot, super talented, has written some of the biggest songs in country music. Uh, a lot of them that she didn't sing, you'd be surprised of, of the songs that she's written. Uh, and when she makes a formal request like this to an organization, don't you think you would, would heed that request and say, okay, Dolly, we get it, you know, uh, and, and thank you for kind of letting us off the hook. But they didn't uh, get off the hook. They're inducting her anyway. And I'm thinking that it's, it's was the wrong thing to do. I think she's going to be very uncomfortable. Knowing Dolly, she will show up at the ceremony because it's not like her to ignore something like that. So uh, I, would, I would expect her to be there in November when they do the dog and pony show for the inductions and all that stuff. Um, but I'll bet, she feels, I'll bet she feels uncomfortable. I'll bet she wishes she was not announced as an inductee. Am I getting this wrong or like, it just feels strange to me. I thought once you said, I, I don't really want to be a part of that club, that, you know, the great Yogi Bear, I don't want to be a part of, I don't want to be a member of any club that would have me as a member. Yeah. Yeah. Him and, him and Groucho Marx. Um, oh, was that a Groucho Marx? I think it was a Groucho Marx. Okay. But that's all right. Um, Yogi and Groucho were a lot alike, except uh, Groucho couldn't, couldn't hit a melon at two <laughs> miles an hour. Um, it's, uh, speaking of which, the Jays are having a good season. Okay. Um, congratulations to Leafs fan. Game number one, game number two, uh, a win. Uh, game number two tonight. Uh, go Leafs, go. Uh, good luck. Um, while, we're talking, uh, while we're talking about, uh, we're going to go back to music in a second. While we're talking about hockey, uh, we had uh, the Ice Dogs as a topic of conversation for a couple of weeks. There was uh, rumors swirling around, but these are rumors that would always swirl around considering the, the uh, publicity that uh, they've had in the last little while that uh, there's a potential sale in the works. Kevin, I don't know if you're, you've got your ear closer to the hockey ground than I do. I don't know if you've heard any more on that, but um, it was just a, sort of a thing that flicked across my radar screen this week, and that's about all. Yeah, I mean, they're rumored to be sold to a guy in Brantford who I think has a, has a Tier 2 junior team and maybe a Junior C team as well. Seems like a big leap for somebody to make, to go from the uh, OG PHL to the yeah. OHL. Yeah, big, so, big leap. I don't yeah. know. I'm, Whatever. I'll, I'll just tell you, though, Lee, um, if you remember the history, the, uh, the taxpayers of Niagara built a beautiful new arena. Yes. To which the owners of the Ice Dogs said they would pledge $1 million towards. Mm -hmm. And then pulled that million dollars back when they couldn't name the road in perpetuity. And now their franchise is worth probably four times as much now that we, the taxpayers, built them a new home. Yeah. And we're kissing the ground they walk on. Them's the facts. We shall see how that story continues to unfold. And it's a multifaceted, multi-headed monster, as they say, about this story. Let's roll uh, back the hands of time a little bit more here and talk about uh, music. And a band that um, almost impossible to categorize when it came to their music and their entertainment and even the characters that were in the band. Hard to, hard to figure out who was who was whom and what was what, and uh, they were just so, sort of like, you know what Andy Kaufman was like as a comic? You never knew, uh, like, really who he was. The Beastie Boys were kind of the same way, Kevin, and uh, you were a huge fan of them. I mean, I knew of them, and I appreciated some of the things that they did, but I wouldn't have called myself a diehard fan. You, on, on the other hand, were uh, a diehard Beastie Boys fan, and... Uh, one of their key members, it was 10 years ago today, was it? Yeah, 10 years ago today, the world lost uh, MCA, or Adam Yauk. Yeah. A member of the Beastie Boys. I think everybody had a band growing up. What was your band, Lee? Like, was it 
was it Zeppelin? Was it the Who? The Guess Who? Like which band really wow. grabbed a hold of your identity? And you you said, yeah, that's that's Me? my band. Uh, Steppenwolf. Um, that they, they were they were probably for me the most powerful blues based classic rock band in my head uh, the writing that uh, that Kay did and the, the the lyrics of their songs were plaintive and uh, and yet and yet sort of disguised by this driving rhythm that uh, often disguised the lyrics often uh, you often lost the lyric uh, because the music was so powerful but um, yeah, so I, I think they would they would have been mine. Uh, and was the Beastie Boys yours? That's how powerful they were for you. Yeah, for me it was the Beastie Boys, like dead stop. How would you define the Beastie Boys? Because as I said, I always had a difficult time trying to put them in a category. Well, they are so difficult to define because I mean, most people on the surface say hip hop band, right? They were a rap hip hop band kind of sort of but as they morphed away from ill communication uh, or sorry licensed to ill and moved into the likes of check your head and ill communication into the 90s uh, they picked their instruments up again because their mm -hmm. origins were really a punk band so they started playing rock and roll and on one album you would have what some people would consider to be like kind of hardcore hip-hop you would have light and fun hip-hop yeah you would have rock and roll songs you would have punk songs and believe it or not you would have purely instrumental instrumentals songs. I actually was, uh, w when I was uh, going to get back into the talk radio business, I, I was looking for a song or a, or a melody, I guess, to be more precise, that I would use uh, as sort of a signature uh, introduction piece of music uh, for my program whenever it was on. And I found this song, and it was just so neat. It was all instrumental. I had no idea until I identified it, till I f tried to find out who did it, that it was the Beastie Boys. It was called Electric Worm, of all things. And I thought, man, what a talented bunch. And there was some of it that was electronics. There was some of it that was uh, uh, sort of electronic, uh, el electronically created, but just an engaging, an engaging melody and rhythm and all the rest of it. And I, it, it kind of blew me away when I realized it was the Beastie Boys that did it. Yeah, so 10 years ago today, I'm just having some uh, internet problems behind the scenes here, because I wanted to play a video of MCA. It was really cool on the Beastie Boys when MCA right. passed away to just proclaim that we're done. We're done as a group. We, we're, we're, we're three of us, and two of us does not Beastie Boys make. Right. And to this day... they good for them. Yeah, they've kept their word. They've never performed. I mean, yeah. the, other rem the remaining members, Mike D, um, Ad Rock... They've appeared as guests on, you know, a cut here right. or a cut there, but as as Beastie as Boys, as the Beastie Boys, no, yeah. and they released a book, and I read that thing. You know, the moment it came out, I was cover to cover on that. Um, they released a bit of a, a documentary. It's really just the two remaining members reading yeah. the book. That's on uh, Apple TV, and I watched the heck out of that. But MCA, you know, going back. Um, not really was he the driving force of Beastie Boys, but he really helped transform a lot of their fandom. And a lot of people that grew up with right. Beastie Boys in the ill communication days, they were, um, oh, sorry, I keep saying that, in License to Ill days, they were frat boys, right? I mean, they were beer Those swilling. are album names you're quoting. Yeah, exactly. So that was like mid-80s, right? Fight for Your yeah. Right, Girls, stuff yeah. like that. Um, and then MCA kind of became the conscious of the band, or the conscience, rather, of the band. And he started hanging out with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and he raised a lot of money for Tibet in the Tibetan Freedom Concerts. And that was all him and all his doing. Yeah, very, very eclectic personalities, all of those guys. And this is one of the things that I find with um, commercial radio. And that's how I made my, my living for many, many years. And, uh, and I'm, I mean, it's very close to my heart and soul, that medium. Uh, but one of the things that music radio did uh, have a tendency to do is typecast certain artists for people that were casual fans. For someone like uh, you, Kevin, uh, that, that were like really diehard fans, you were more in tune, again, there's a terrible pun, with, um, with the various nuances of the band. People that were radio listeners that were just uh, like hit radio listeners that were casual fans of their music, 
where I'm going with this is almost, if you say Beastie Boys to the, like, the general population around the world, they say, fight for the right to partake. And that's pretty much about where it ends. Yeah, you're bang on. Because commercial radio made, made that a hit. And it was almost a novelty song. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that musicians or the musical community took terribly seriously uh, because they didn't take themselves all that seriously. But the thing is, they're, t- they're typecast with that, with that piece of music. And that's what, uh, that's what commercial uh, distribution does sometimes to bands. And it's, it's, really not, it's really not fair. But that's, I guess, the way the way music goes, especially in the, in the world of uh, record labels and making money and selling records. But uh, anyway, 10 years, hard to believe it was 10 years ago. Yeah, I got a little, um, and, and what we're just waiting, Lee, you can tee up, um, we're supposed to have Freak Show Comics coming yeah. on, I'm just trying to touch base with them, um, but they had a bad break in, and I want to get to a, uh, an MCA tribute here. Yeah, uh, so I will talk about this while, uh, while Kevin's working on that. Um, Amy and Keith are the owners of Freak Show Comics. Uh, it's a comic book based and other memorabilia business up on Lundy's Lane in Niagara Falls. And they were broken into this past uh, Monday, I think it was. And about $20,000 worth of product was stolen it seemed like it was done by somebody that knew where they were and what stuff they wanted as opposed to just a, a casual smash and grab. So uh, we'll talk to Amy and Keith about that, but it's, a, it's terrible. I mean, this stuff, it's irreplaceable, and we'll talk to them about that. The other thing that on the, uh, on the heels of that that dovetails into the same conversation, for those of you that are fans of this kind of uh, this kind of stuff. This is free comic book day. Now, I don't I don't know how many uh, memorabilia shops or comic book stores or uh, uh, um, hobby stores or you know whatever. Um, I don't know if they still recognize it. I'm assuming they do. I mean, you're, you're not going to get one of the uh, coveted historical things that are worth thousands of dollars, but you might get a a free off the shelf comic on this uh, free. So find yourself a comic book store and uh, who knows, you might get a free comic if you're a, if you're a fan. You found it? Yeah, so here's a little tribute to uh, MCA and uh, during interviews and occasionally, I mean famously once even at the Grammy Awards, he took on the persona of Nathaniel Hornblower. He was completely made up. They said he was a Swedish <laughs> uncle or something like that. Yeah, which he looked so. kind of like a Burt Reynolds clone. <laughs> main thing about doing stunt work is safety first. I learned that from Burt Reynolds himself because if you're not going to be safe, if you're not going to be careful of the people around, mm-hmm. the people who are in the vicinity watching you do a manly stunt, then uh, you might hurt somebody. <laughs> And can't play the music or, you know, the copyright people get on us. Yeah, I mean, the... Uh, there they are. I mean, just absolutely shaped my childhood. And I kind of grew up as they grew up, which I found really interesting. And if that's the one thing, if I ever met them, that's the thing that I, w- that I would pass along to them. I said, yeah. hey, you know what? As you guys matured, I matured. And, you know, you went from guys that were, um, kind of, you know, beer-swilling, bigoted guys in the 80s to accepting loving people in the 90s and I, I don't know if society followed that that growth chart but I know I did well I think that uh, in a lot of these cases these entertainers that you you kind of write off as uh, just uh, off the wall characters I think they're very very brilliant entertainers uh, in their own right and they're not stupid people they're probably uh, they're probably off the scale, actually, when it comes to uh, it comes to their their intelligence and what they were able to do, and they just had fun and did so many different things. So you got you got to give them points for versatility, if nothing else. Yeah, and uh, MCA really was that, and I've come to learn that he was kind of the uh, the driving force behind the uh, behind the entire band, which is why I think the the remaining two members said, "Yeah, we can't go on. Yeah, we can't go on without him." Yeah. Anyway, we've got uh, Amy and Keith standing by here from uh, from Freak Show Comics. Excellent. And uh, and I'll let you say uh, hello to the both of them. I shall do that with great 
pleasure. Hi, Amy. Hi, Keith. Uh, welcome Hi to Niagara 411 Live. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? We're fine. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now, I set this up a little bit earlier. You were probably watching. So you guys were burgled, for the lack of a yeah, better yeah. word, on, on yes, Monday. Yes, we were. That was Monday evening, yes. Yeah. Well, tell, tell, us, tell us what you know. Um, well, uh, at 10.46, somebody, uh, two gentlemen, um, threw a rock through the glass door and uh, just came right busting in and went right for what they wanted, which was between twenty and $30,000 worth of items. And they ran out, and it was within 40 seconds they were in and out and gone. What was it that they took that was worth that amount of money? Graded comics. Yeah, CGC graded comics. Um, Specifically, uh, Amy will show you one here. Like these. They're yeah. encased. They're, you can see there's a CGC is a company in Florida. Right. They're the premier grading service in the in the world for comic books. Okay. And we are Niagara's only dealer for CGC. Um, we lost, most notably, a uh, an Amazing Spider-Man number six rated 4.5. Um, it was also signed by Stan Lee. Um, wow. We had it up at about $3,500, which was market value. Um, there was also another $1,000 comic book stolen. That was also a Spider-Man uh, number 800. It was That was signed as well, graded 9.8. And they, Is this out they of 10? knew exactly. Yes, this is out of 10. 10s are impossible to get. Almost impossible. 9.9s are pretty hard to get to 9.8 is the standard but um they came in they knew exactly what they were going for they grabbed two boxes of books and a handful of the the higher end stuff that we had in the cabinet right beside it and like amy said they were in and out in 40 seconds um okay so those of us that are on the outside looking in would say this was somebody that obviously knew who you are knows the store how would they know where that stuff is is this uh, some sort of uh, someone that you know how would they know no no I, I don't think so um we have I, I mean it's niagara falls we're right on lundy's lane um it's become like heavily touristy again after two years of, of no tourists but yeah. we've had a lot of people from out of town they come in um you know they you never know. Like we have a lot of traffic that comes in, especially on weekends. We don't know everybody who comes in our doors. So would they have would they have been able to come in and sort of as as they say in uh, cop shows, case the joint? Would they have been yep, able yes. to see this Absolutely. box of material? Yeah. They we keep them right here on the counter, like oh. so right. that so for safety, so that people don't run out of right. the store with them. Yeah, right. So that's more for like a, if somebody tried to come in and just grab it off the counter and run out the door. I mean, we've never had that kind of problem before, but yeah, um, this was a whole other thing. Uh, they obviously must have been in the store. They knew exactly where to go, what to grab. Yeah. Um, so they were we on a mission. We currently have somebody um, looking through our footage over the last uh, like few weeks, at least, trying to get some sort of identification. We do have video footage of the burglary, um, oh. but it's night vision, so. And they were they were wearing hoodies, masks, hats. There's a right. couple things that make them somewhat identifiable, so I am hoping that yeah. we're able to pick that up on our uh, daytime footage. Good, because that was going to be one of my questions prior. as to whether you had that kind of that kind of uh, footage or not. Um, yeah, our, our, our footage uh, allows us to go back, I think, uh, 30 days. Right. So we'll be able to, it's going to take some time to kind of scrub through that footage and, and look for any kind of like identifying markers of any kind. Right now on the screen, we are showing the footage from your store of these two guys coming in yeah. and out with the boxes. Kevin uh, has access to that CCTV yep. material. Yes. Yeah, and, I spoke to Kevin yesterday. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, as, as you say, there are a couple of things that you notice. Hopefully they'll be able to be, be used as identifying markers. We won't go there just in case mm -hmm. uh, we get in the way of the investigation <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to help it. So. Um, this would have this material would have been worth, uh, as you said, 
twenty thousand dollars at plus, least yeah plus uh, yes. in in retail what are what are you out of pocket for this for this rare material due to the fluctuation um probably about the same because some books go down in value some go up in value yeah. so uh, you know it's pretty much a direct loss wow. for yeah. us like and, a, and, I, and i guess you're shopping all of the time too constantly always like we we buy and sell more than our customers do <laughs> just to <laughs> just to keep the stock rolling in and i mean keeping interesting stuff in store it's that yeah. kind of an industry like we can't have stale stock we're always rotating on a weekly basis comics in comics out toys in toys out are the are the are the local investigators um on top of this to your satisfaction with looking at looking for these guys we haven't heard anything more beyond that night um the officers that attended were wonderful uh we had forensics here um they had the canine nudit out um they, they were absolutely fantastic apparently the case is going to be uh sent to the detective squad yeah um, but we have not heard anything further um, but we are taking measures. I've asked for a copy of the police report to be sent to me um, because that's necessary to uh, be able to secure some of these valuables so that they may not be able to be resold. How long have these got? How long have you been in business, guys? Six years. It'll be six years. Oh, it was just past six years. April, April 2016. Um, I oh, bought yeah. I bought the neutral zone from John Roma and, uh -huh. and turned it into Freak Show Comics. Well, good for you because that's a that's a that's a pretty good run for small businesses these days, especially having to go through the whole COVID experience and. Uh, oh, and, that was been interesting. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yeah, and, and well, especially this... especially a business like yours, where people want to they want to see and and assess the value of these of this memorabilia for themselves. It's kind of it's it's not something you want to buy over the phone. No, no, not a lot of time to no. know. You have to really have a good relationship. Thankfully, yeah. um, over the course of COVID, we've been able to build that kind of relationship with people from out of town, um, just over the phone or over online, because we do have a very strong local reputation and people trust us and as well they should, because we would never do anything to harm our relationships with anybody. We've got a couple more questions for you. And this one, as, as thieves are concerned, yeah. Probably the easiest uh, or the the most important part of stealing something is to be able to turn that into cash. That's right. These are very specialized items that were taken from you. How does somebody, here we go with the cool uh, criminal talk again, how does somebody fence this stuff? Like, how do they go about turning this into cash without getting caught? Well, again, due, due to our... Um our reputation within Niagara and what is expanded, it's going to be difficult for them to do so. Every one of the books that was stolen has a unique serial number right on it. I can actually give you an example with this one here. I don't know how well the camera's going to pick that up, but you can see right yeah. there, there's a unique barcode with yeah. a serial number. Yeah. Every one of those serial numbers is unique to each book. Um, that list of our missing books within 24 hours has been spread to every major comic book outlet in and, North America. And we're viewing it right now. So I yeah. repeat, how does somebody make any money if, from this? If they have, if they had a private buyer lined up already, uh, that would be the easiest way to go right. um, because they could just do a direct sale and that buyer never has to show those comic books to anybody. Um, if they didn't have a direct buyer, uh, they would have to actually smash these books out of the cases and sell them without the grading, which is going to drop the value of each book by about Insanely. 50%. Right. Yeah. So, so the only so, way yeah. to get them to get them out there and then back into the market on traceable is to crack them open out of the slab, which decreases the yeah. value. Yeah. It's like having the providence of uh, any pe any work of art. Uh, exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. Without the you providence, know, it's not worth anything, really. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's. And then the, the like the Stan Lee sign book is going to be the worst one because 
you can't really do anything with that. The the signature is in a very unique place. I have a very, very high res scan of the book itself. So any wow. flaws that are on the cover uh, are blatantly shown. You can't alter that. You can't change it. I mean, if you've ever seen an old worn book, you'll never see another worn book in that way in, in the same condition they right. all have a unique sort of like yeah, bend here or a whitening in the corner and all of these little things that we know to look for as well as like the signature itself stanley signed so chaotically that uh, <laughs> almost every one of his signatures can be almost unique themselves right uh as well as signature placement stuff like that so uh, that book um if it shows up on the open market, it it will be flagged. Even the grading company CGC that we deal with, they have a list of the books themselves. So, are you going to so put some? Are you going to put some wire mesh or steel bars or something like that on your on your windows? Well, now? yeah. I mean, we Absolutely. we are working on dealing with that this week. Um, yeah. It looks like a friend of ours may have a solution for us. Yeah. Um, that's going to severely <laughs> impact anybody doing this to us again okay um appreciate you guys coming on i i hope the detective uh part of the uh nrps is able to help you i mean it it should because of what was taken as you say unless they've already got a private buyer somewhere there should be some red flags pop up oh at, yeah at there some at some point and hopefully uh, I mean, hopefully they catch the people, but I mean, on a wish list would be that you get your stuff back. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. That's definitely what I'd like. And, and to, to have these people be caught so that they don't damage any other small businesses, we can't take that. We've had two no. years of absolute madness. I'm sure. One more, been... one more question on, on maybe a lighter note uh, is uh, coming up on Saturday is what has historically been known as Free Comic Book Day. Yes. That's right, Free Comic Book do you Day. Guys, Everybody's favorite day of the year. Do, do you guys recognize Free Comic Book Day? Oh, we absolutely. celebrate it. It, it. it is our religious holiday, if you will. Okay. Yep. All Everybody right. needs to come out, grab some free books. We've got, we're going to have some some uh, sales on, some mystery boxes, mystery bags, uh, just a whole fun time. Okay, it's so always a great time. tell us exactly where uh, Freak Show Comics is, so we can find you Saturday for sure. So we're at we're five nine nine two Lundy's Lane. Uh, we're near the intersection of Main and Ferry. Um, well, most people kind of in the industry know where we are, but yeah. if you're coming coming down the lane, uh, down Battlefield Hill, uh, we're on your right hand side, just before the lights, in a brick building. <laughs> Well, uh, we have ample parking. There's free yeah. free municipal parking lot right beside our building. Yep. Well, that is that is music to uh, tourists and uh, locals alike. Free parking. I hope so. Those, those, see them all the, here. Those, those are the two magic words: free parking these days. Absolutely, yep. and yeah. free comics. <laughs> and yep. free comics. All right, um, uh, Amy, Keith, uh, sorry for what you had to experience last Thank Monday. You so much. I, I know it's like a feeling of being violated, and it, yes. It, it takes people a while to, it's almost like a PTSD thing. It takes you a while. It really is. You know, we, we, we are here so much in our store that it actually, our store just feels like a, a second living room yeah. to our, our house. And it's, it is equally akin to like somebody busting into your house. Very, very and, violating. Uh, and uh, I, I don't wish that feeling on, on anyone. Um, Keep us posted on on the progress, we and we'll definitely keep our fingers, eyes, and toes crossed, and everything that uh, that this is uh, ratified in a in a positive way for you. I hope so too. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank Thanks, guys. guys. Have fun, have fun on Saturday. We Love will. You. Thank you for your time. All Take right, care. you are more than welcome. Come back anytime. Thanks. And Bye. may the fourth be with you. No, with you. No, I insist. With you. No, with you. Um, there you go. Celebrate Star Wars Day, 15% off all Star Wars action figures at Freak Show Comics as well. Um, two of the friends of this show, Kevin, are massive, massive Star Wars fans. One of them being uh, our, uh, our trucker Dave, Dave Benison. 
you know, like off the charts Star Wars fan collector memorabilia, all that kind of stuff, as well as our sci our, our weather. Uh, our meteorologist and science writer for the Weather Network, Scott Sutherland, just absolutely loaded up. He built the, uh, the the Lego Star Fighters and and all that uh, all that stuff. So I have uh, a number of people. I cannot claim to be a, an aficionado or a historian of Star Wars by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, those two people keep me attached to it. So may the may the fourth be with you uh, and with you. Okay, um, Kevin, that's amazing. Uh, I, st I still think to steal something like that, you, you either do have a private buyer or you're stupid. I don't know, I, I don't, I don't know which. But if you're, gonna, if you're gonna take a chance on stealing something, breaking into a store, committing a felony, you should be stealing something that's a little bit easier to, to move, a little bit easier to, to cash in on. Than, than something like that. Yeah. I mean, that's like stealing a Ferrari from somebody's driveway. How do you sell that? You can sell a Honda, but you're probably not going to be able to sell a Ferrari, and it's the same kind of same kind of concept. It's uh, usually a reason why people turn to a life of crime, Lee, and it's not because uh, the Mensa Club was full. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, except there are some people that are pretty intelligent. If they'd used that for good instead of evil, it, they'd be better off. Yeah, every once in a while, you know, you watch a movie like, uh, you know, uh, Catch Me If You Can. Oh. And you think about that guy and you go, wow, if only you had used your skills for good. And if but he, he ended up he doing did. that. Yeah, ultimately he did. Yeah, yeah that, was, uh, that was interesting. Um, coming up uh, shortly, Natalie Bebo. Um, Director extraordinaire. The credits uh, she did the uh, the Walrus Whisperer. You remember, which was the uh, um, the the documentary about Marineland, and uh, her new one is called The Unsolved Murder of Beverly Lynn Smith. A cold case. Uh, it's been cold so long it's been frozen in time, uh, but her documentary airs Friday, this Friday, uh, on Amazon Prime. It's going to be airing in 240 countries and territories around the world. And uh, she joins us in uh, mere seconds, or minutes, as the case may be. I want to thank Gail's Gas Bars for fueling this program. Uh, it's been a while since we mentioned it, since the beginning of the show. Sorry about that, uh, Gail's. Um, actually, I, I noticed that um, Maybe we'll reach out to Jessica in the coming weeks. Um, and I was thinking about this the other day, and all of a sudden it popped up on my Facebook page. Jessica Friesen, CEO of Gales Gas, was interviewed by uh, the CBC recently about the impact of gasoline companies, petrol companies, uh, of electric vehicles. As, as electric vehicles, be as EVs, as they call them, uh, and of course, they call the gas vehicles uh, CE uh, combust uh, combustion uh, internal ICE internal combustion engines. That's the that's the gas talk for uh, for cars that take gasoline. So the impact of I, uh, of EVs on ICEs was uh, the subject of a, an interview that Jessica did with the CBC yeah. recently, and um, so um, it's going to be something to watch. Uh, as this story evolves. Uh, but we thank them for fueling this program on a regular basis as our prime sponsor. Also want to thank Performance Heating and Air. Carlo, thank you for your continued support. Mark Shirk, Blake, and the gang at uh, Verge Insurance Group. All of these are born and bred and supporting Niagara and born and bred right here. You can join this program, as you'll see uh, by the, uh, the ban uh, banner at the bottom by clicking the Zoom link in the post, and that will uh, click you into our uh, green room, our Zoom room green room, where uh, our uh, close personal friend uh, and uh, executive producer, Kevin, will uh, get you ready to go and all primed up and uh, come on. You can talk about uh, the, uh, the May the 4th or anything you want as we go forward. And uh, Lee, I mean, exactly. I got the green room right next to me here and looking for anybody to hop in. And I can see right now that uh, Welland filmmaker Natalie Bebo is here and waiting. So let's get her on the program. Yay. Hi again, Natalie. How you doing today? 
Hi, I am great. How are you? Uh, I'm t I'm terrific. I'm I'm actually I'm a little disappointed. Okay. Uh, and you know I'm you know I'm being sar a little sarcastic. That I haven't had a chance to narrate any of your works yet. <laughs> I know. You know, we just haven't found the right project for you, Lee. It's got to right. be uh, the perfect one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Way to wiggle out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie Bebo, uh, uh, all kidding aside, um, you're having a great run, and and with this with this documentary that's coming out. Um, I, th I, I think this is going to be something that just absolutely rivets people to their screens when they have a chance to watch it. The Unsolved Murder of Beverly Lynn Smith. Um, now, the premiere happens Friday uh, on Amazon Prime. It's released, but it came out at a, at a festival called Hot Docs. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, now, when was that? Last Saturday, last Saturday night at six o'clock. We had a public screening unlike any I have ever done. Um, you know, The Walrus and the Whistleblower, as you might remember, came yeah. out at Hot Talks um, right when the pandemic started. So its premiere was virtual. Um, and this one here, two years later, was in person with a, a packed theater, um, including with the some of the family members of Beverly Lynn Smith. So it was wow. an incredibly powerful night. Yeah. Wow. Where? What, what theater? <laughs> at the TIFF Lightbox in Toronto. Uh, that must have been absolutely a crowning, uh, a, a crowning achievement for you. You must have been so proud of that. I was, yeah, and I was really proud of our whole team. You know, we had 250 people work on this project. It was a, uh, a huge, huge, huge accomplishment for us. A lot of us were there that night, and so we, uh, we, we celebrated and um, and honored the uh, all the the work that we did, and also the 50 years of incredible story and history that surrounds uh, this case. Now, um, the, 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 the description that comes with this, the, the pending release of your documentary, um, says it was designed to investigate a suspect in the murder of 22-year-old Beverly Lynn Smith, but only ended up raising more questions. Um, it, it, it's done from Amazon Studios, produced in association with Muse Entertainment, uh, and of course, you you directed this this picture. Um, what what got you involved with this? How did you how did how did this grab you? And how did you become involved with it? Mm -hmm. Well, I had just released uh, the Walrus and the Whistleblower not too long before that, and it was brought to me in part because of that film, because of the success of that film, but also the type of treatment that I applied to what was a. a thorny story, I mean, as you might might remember, with some legal implications, some journalistic implications, um, I treated that story with a certain um, character-driven approach with emotional uh, nuances. Right. And um, Amazon and Muse wanted something similar um, applied to this story. So it was brought to me on the back of that. I was gripped by it immediately. I actually have a, a relative on my mom's side of the family that's currently in jail because of this type of sting operation. So it wow. hit home for me right from the start. Um, and the potential to work with such rich, eccentric characters again uh, was just something I couldn't pass up. It seems to be my calling card. <laughs> well, it's fascinating for those of us that watch them as, as, as well. I can understand how you would be uh, sort of drawn in or, or fished in or whatever it is to, to these stories and the characters are, if, if, if you didn't know they were true, you wouldn't believe them. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many twists and turns. It's stranger than fiction, this one. It's, it's shocking, you know, at every single turn. Uh, my son was with me, um, who is 13 that night. And at the end of each episode, he reached over and grabbed my knee and he said, Mommy, what happens next? What happens next? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think that it really is um, a story that will, uh, will shock people start to finish. How many cut. episodes are there? There are four episodes. Four. Um, Okay, can you without without being a, a spoiler, which we don't want to want to do, um, can you give us a for those people that might not be familiar at all with the story? Can you give us sort of a Coles Notes version of what 
what happened, what this story is about? Mm -hmm. Well, at the heart of the story is uh, a tragic event that happened on December 9th, 1974, just outside of Oshawa in a red brick farmhouse. Somebody came into that house, shot a woman once in the back of the head. Her baby was in the room. Uh, she died. And for years, the case went cold. Uh, she was one of four sisters. Uh, one in particular was her twin, who uh, has been on a quest for justice ever since that night. And it's only three decades later when there start, starts to be some serious movement in the case, um, an arrest is made, uh, a controversial investigation is launched, um, somebody else sort of comes into the story, and all of a sudden this, this you know, the life and the, the murder of this woman gets intertwined with some very big questions about what we are allowed to do in our society in the name of justice how far should we be able to go in the name of justice and of solving crime but also how far would you want the police to go if it was your family member mm -hmm. who was murdered so these are the big questions we start to ask um ab about this murder about the fact that it's a cold case and um and we take it all the uh, almost all all the way to the present day Fascinating. And who wrote this project? How do you mean, sorry? Wrote it. Like uh, Amazon Prime came to you with the project, or yeah, you start, so, or, yeah. or, or you started the the, the pro. No, no, it came it came to me. To you. And uh, we had a, a team of people working on it. Um, there was a, a wonderful executive story editor named Andrea Stewart. Okay. Um, I worked with a wonderful producer named Tara Jan. Uh, then there were executive producers at Muse. And together we shaped the vision for it and built the narrative arc to be able to hit all the right points in the story. Okay. And build towards this very dramatic conclusion. Uh, and my my initial question, I probably should have asked that, left it until now. Who was the script writer? Like who, who handled writing the scripts or was it a team effort that did that as well? It was a team effort, um, but our executive story editor, Andrea Stewart led that, uh, led that charge. Okay, so you built, you took this story with your team uh, and, and built every nuance of the production like from the ground up. Yeah, I was hired as the series director and then eventually also became the showrunner, which means that my role was to oversee every single department from writing to directing to cinematography to post-production. All of the creative basically fell under me. Wow. And like I said, I had a team of 250 extraordinarily talented people working very hard to put this together. Unbelievable. And and you know what, um, Natalie, you, you are such a, such a down-to-earth, unassuming, um, girl next door with this amazing talent and an incredible gift and uh, it's nice that we can uh, that the Rose City can claim you a, a, as a, a rose of its uh, of its society because man you've uh, you've done some uh, some incredible work I, ca I can't wait to, for this to for this to come out it's awesome and yeah uh, I hope that people uh, you know just sit down and absorb it it's really it's a it's a gripping story but it's also incredibly important actually in this in this uh time right now and natalie it's it's kevin here and i don't know if there's a name for people that are addicted to documentaries but i i'm that guy <laughs> Me, i can't yeah. yeah i know you're the same Ailey. i mean we, we I, oh. should come up with one yeah yeah it should be because i mean you know that's all i do i just sort by category go to documentaries and see what's there and i can't I wait too. for friday because i'm absolutely going to binge this thing you call me saturday morning i'm done i will have watched all four episodes uh lee touched on something there i mean you are well and born went to uh, went to school in welland and you are achieving some incredible things have you have you had any local recognition here in Niagara? Like I'm thinking, except from us, key to the city, <laughs> or um, you know, as the high school called you to to have you come in and speak to the class or anything along those lines. Not yet, no, no. Nope. Wow, you'd be a you'd be a fabulous <laughs> you'd be a fabulous uh, guest lecturer uh, at uh, just down the street, as a matter of fact, at the the Brock Performing. Uh, school for the Performing Arts and things uh, like that. Wow, what a what a resource uh, that that you would be, and how you uh, how you take how you take an interest in something and build it into a career like like you have done. Um, how do you do that? I mean, you you must be just a relentless reader or researcher or something. 
Yes. I mean, I've always been a reader and I've always been interested in story. You know, even when I was a little girl and I thought I might be a lawyer when I was older or a diplomat. I mean, you know, we all have these dreams when we're little. Sure. My heart was always in, in storytelling. And so I find that um, the, 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 the strongest thing that I do is I listen to people. Because I think when you really listen to people and you legitimately empathize and care about who they are and what their stories are, it enables you to tap into universal themes that we all feel as humans. And, and I think that's a storyteller's gift is, is actually to, to listen and then have the skill to be able to put it together in a story that then relates to other humans. And so um, I do read a lot, I listen a lot, I travel a lot, um, I take a lot of risks, um, and I follow my, my heart. As um, trite as that my sound, I actually follow my intuition a lot, and that seems to have led me in, in some excellent places. So well, far. your instincts are damn fine, as far as I can tell. Um, Thank you. <laughs> now, again, you, you had to have um, been in the place that these real characters were in, uh, in the Oshawa area. What did that feel like? It was a, a bit of an out-of-body experience, honestly, because we were even filming on the street where this happened. And we were doing it when possible, you know, very early in the morning or later in the evening, so not to disturb the neighborhood because it is a, a small, intimate community. The house has since been torn down, yeah. so we couldn't film the actual house, but the memory and the trauma of that crime has never left. I mean, it's imprinted on the terrain there and in the memory of the people who live there. So we were very um, sensitive to that and filmed with, you know, um, with uh, as much um, respect as, as we could. And we filmed all around that area, drone shots and uh, traveling shots to be able to give Oshawa a character as yeah. well, right? Because this is Durham region's oldest cold case um, that, that Amazon is telling here. And they've chosen this as their first Canadian original true crime documentary series ever. Wow. So, you know, having this particular crime in this particular place um, was, it was important to highlight the Canadian-ness of the story and also the, that particular era where it happened. So we, we filmed a lot. We talked to a lot of local people who still remember what happened and who are still horrified by the fact that officially um, this is still unsolved, even though there are many people who believe they, they know who did it. Well, we are so very proud of you. Uh, not that that counts for a whole lot, but we are. Uh, you're uh, wrong. It and, counts for a lot. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, just so fascinating that uh, in our own backyard, we have uh, fostered such a, such a gift, such a talent, and, uh, and, and congratulations again. I know that this will probably be up for another handful of a of awards as uh, as as time goes by uh glad you had an opportunity to do the hot dogs festival thing that you didn't uh get a chance to do with uh, the walrus and the whistleblowers so that's 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 a win right there yeah uh, that was a full circle moment for sure yeah what okay so uh the unsolved murder uh, the unsolved murder of beverly lynn smith uh begins friday night it's four episodes uh, on Amazon Prime, what time in our time zone is this going to be airing? First thing in the morning. Um, when you wake up, it'll be available to you on May 6th. Okay. Awesome. Beverly. And all, uh, four, episodes, hmm? all four episodes are being put out at the same time as well. So cool. feel free to watch them all to, together. To, yeah, to just join binge Kevin. It. Join right. Kevin in the binge watch. <laughs> Natalie Bebo, <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Congratulations again. Uh, and uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk often in the future. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Kevin? Sounds like a great story. I honestly can't wait. Yeah. I love Canadian documentaries. I absolutely was riveted by Natalie's work on Walrus and the Whistleblower. Yeah. The the spin she was able to put on that, I I don't want to say I can't really put it into words because I'll try because it was it was a contentious issue and she handled it very delicately. 
And that was a very difficult thing to do. It was a human story. It was an animal story. It was a legal story. It was a passionate story. It was a community story. It was a business story. There's all those things. And she managed to put all of that into about 90 minutes and you can tell especially, that it's a it's a project of passion for her yeah especially with something um like like that one the walrus and the whistleblower where i mean anytime you involve animals people can just get uh, i don't know where these puns are coming from today but they get rap rabidly <laughs> emotional uh over uh, over over animals and it's it's almost always black and white it's like Oh, you, you you know, terrible! You should rot in hell. And then over here, well, no, it's not here. But very rarely are, do, do you get those uh, those gray areas. And she did. You're right. She did cover the nuances of that story incredibly well. And I'm sure she'll do the same with this one. And I will say, uh, Natalie, if you're still listening, as somebody that watches a lot of documentaries, it is almost always in the filmmaker and the presentation. I have watched oh, for sure. documentaries that are incredibly made about subjects that I don't care anything about, and yeah. it's an incredible experience. And conversely, I've watched documentaries about things that I was greatly interested in that were put together so poorly that I never made it to the end. Isn't that the truth? And, isn't, uh, and, isn't and I know, uh, I know Natalie's fine touch that she's going to put on this yeah. story and the Canadianism of it. Um, I mean, honestly, Friday night I will have watched all four episodes. Filmmakers and TV show makers are, uh, are, are gifted when, and you, I know almost everybody watching this show will say the same thing, when the hour that you've been watching feels like 10 minutes. And you know they're not all that gifted when the hour that you've been watching seems like you've been sitting there all night. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> how how an hour or forty five minutes or however long an episode is, uh, how it can seem like two minutes over here and two hours over there. I don't know how filmmaking. Uh, uh, they say it's all in the editing, but I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, just a, just a star, a worldwide star for Amazon Prime, who uh, is no small entity comes to you and says, we'd like you to do our project? Wow. <laughs> Hello? Yes, yeah, yes, please. Hello? Um, Lee, just to move things along, I mean, lots of great talent in Niagara is getting the spotlight, including last night we had a, a, a pair of brothers drafted yeah. into the CFL. Indeed. And I'll throw up uh, Trey here. So, two brothers from Thorold. Uh, had very successful um, high school, collegiate careers. Trey Ford, quarterback. And uh, what was it? What was the stat, Kevin, that you were talking to me earlier for him? He's the, the first or the... I think Trey is the, the highest Canadian quarterback after, ever drafted in into the draft. CFL. Yeah. So an actual Canadian-born quarterback, the highest any team has ever taken a Canadian-born quarterback. And it was uh, the eighth pick Edmonton last night overall. Trey Ford, and then his brother Tyrell, who's a defensive back, I think went 13th overall, maybe to Calgary. Yeah. I mean, so both of, both of them drafted in the same year. That's, uh, that's quite a family uh, uh, event. And I can remember reading about them, uh, you know, in the local rags when they were playing high school and thinking about where they're going to go to university. I think they right. both chose University of Waterloo. And then, you know, the prospects of them actually starting in, yeah. their, uh, in their rookie years. And I think they did. And then Trey Ford becoming one of the best football players, and obviously his brother as well, right across Canada, the CIS, and now to this. Now, I made a mistake uh, earlier. I said Edmonton Eskimos. The Edmonton Eskimos don't exist anymore. He was, uh, Trey was drafted by Edmonton, but they're not called that other name anymore. So the my, Elks. My apologies. Uh, yeah, the Elks. There's the, you see the Elk, right? That, that's what reminded me. Uh, that I uh, had to remove my foot from my mouth, so they are the Elks, and yeah. not the other things. But uh, very, <laughs> very happy and proud, not just awesome. not just for them, but their uh, their football family, which includes, of course, their immediately f immediate family, but the the high school coaches and everybody that had a hand in in their career and their ascent now to the CFL. And and uh, and uh, Terrell was drafted by probably. Probably one of Canada's biggest legacy teams, and that's uh, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. 
So that'll be a that'll be a couple of. Is that where we went? I, I I mistakenly said Calgary. I forgot where. Tyrone no, Winnipeg. Went. Was it Winnipeg? I think. Oh it was. man, storied franchise. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna love them in Winnipeg. They will. Yeah, absolutely. Because I'm I'm pretty sure that's what the information said was that uh, Trey went to Edmonton, and uh, and Terrell went to to Winnipeg. A little wrote, bit of a little bit of a rivalry there. You wrote it down, <laughs> and I guessed. So there you go. Yeah, Winnipeg. Tyrell went 13th overall, so eighth and 13th overall, and the highest Canadian-born quarterback ever drafted. Good for the them. CFL. Another another uh, couple of great uh, Niagara success stories. Kevin, um, let's do an update on uh, on our missing persons segments that we have you know I go into a couple of stores and people know what I do here with you and invariably someone mentions the missing people like what do you think how, do, how, why do we have so missing so many people that go missing and, and, and can't be found in Niagara what's going on is it are they connected are they, I mean people people think these things um, and we try to keep you up to date, although a lot of times there is no new information. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, I wish we could offer more information. I'll bring this up on the, um, it's, it's really just a sad post. This is a Katrina Blagden's mother, uh, Katr- Bonnie, who's, who's been on our program before, and she put a post out on May 1st. And remember, she disappeared yeah. on December 31st, January 1st. So May 1st would have marked uh, four months. Katrina, my sweet, sweet baby girl, today has been an agonizing four months, 120 days, 2,880 hours, 172,800 minutes, 103,680,000 seconds since you've been reported missing. I post it this way, my sweet baby girl, to point out that that agony, pain, frustration, sadness, and nightmares don't just exist on one measurement of time. Sometimes one second of agony seems like an hour. Your boys, your family, your friends experience all these measurements of pain every day since you went missing. Many beg, cry, and plead for you to be brought home to us and that this nightmare ends, sweetheart, because you are so loved. We pray, cry, and search endlessly for you, my beautiful girl. Some days we come back at the end of a search feeling defeated, exhausted, only to get back up and do it again. It's agonizing to come back to your home that you love so much and not see you in the kitchen making a cup of tea or sitting on your sofa eating a snack enjoying one of your favorite TV shows or to look out onto your backyard without you with that beautiful smile of yours. It looks so desolate. We're all lost without you and try to comprehend how this could be happening. We try to be strong. We know you didn't just up and walk away from all those who love you. Your boys mean the world to you. You may have been told no one cares about you or loves you. We all know differently. You are so loved and appreciated. Your sons, your family, your friends, and your army who have grown to love you support you. We will never give up. We all love you, sweet, sweet baby girl. You will be found. An incredible tribute uh, from Katrina's mom. And also, um, you know, the search continues for Nick, Nick Adamson. Nick, Nick Adamson is still missing as well, um, and and this is this is the site that pays attention to Nick and keeps putting posts up there. We've updated the missing posters and made a colorful version as well as a black and white version. Please feel free to make copies and post wherever you go. We have also posted PDF versions within the files tab. If you would like us to drop some off to you, please do not hesitate to reach out to us and we would be more than happy to drop some off. Thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and help. Nick Adamson still missing. On the um, positive side of the scale, an 85-year-old man was reported missing but was indeed located and is safe. Uh, The investigation to locate missing person Ray Ellens has been ongoing by Niagara Regional Police Service. Officers assigned to 8th District in Grimsby. I know an officer that works in, Gr- in, that, uh, in that office. But uh, thankfully, Ray was, was located and uh, all, is, all is well there. So that's a, that's a piece of good news. Now speaking of good news, Kevin, there was a, a, 
Good Samaritan story, which uh, we like to see on Niagara 411, and it's nice to touch on these because it does indeed go to the, the basic goodness of the, the heart of humans everywhere. We see atrocities every day. The news of what's going on in, uh, in Europe is, uh, is staggeringly, staggeringly depressing and horrible. But on the flip side come some good news stories. On Sunday, my stepfather had a heart attack while jogging. Some wonderful bystanders jumped in and performed CPR before the paramedics arrived, and it could be the reason he is with us today as he just woke up and is speaking and looks to be making a recovery. My mother and I would like to personally thank whoever this person or persons were, hoping you could make a post for us regarding this. It was Sunday morning that just passed between 9.30 to 10.30-ish. He was found on Huggins Street in Niagara Falls. If they could email me at, and you see the, uh, the post there, that would be amazing. Thanks either way. Now, the comments that followed this post that was up on Niagara 411 kind of uh, cleared up the story a little bit and uh, brought it full circle. Uh, Pam Wicks wrote to R. Johnston, I'm sending you this on behalf of the lady that helped your stepfather. She wishes to remain anonymous. She is greatly relieved to know that he's going to be okay. A gentleman stopped and helped her with your stepfather. He remained there until help came. All she wanted was for him to be okay and go home to his wife and family. She's so happy that it worked out for everyone. There's a lot of good people out there who care and will help. So thank you, Pam, for posting that uh, and bringing it full circle. And. Uh, from Ryan Johnston as a follow-up, that is totally fine. Please let them know we are forever grateful. All of us are so lucky they were there and acted as quickly as they did. Please let them know we cannot thank them enough. And Pam says, will do. Uh, and, and, the, and so many comments after that. Uh, here's uh, one from Stephanie. My husband stopped to make sure 911 had been called. We're so glad to hear he's making a recovery. He said there were people assisting and 911 had already been called, thankfully. CPR saves lives. Even the Paramedic Association weighed in, which is, is way cool. Uh, the NPA says, that's great. Early CPR saves lives. It's so important. Thank you to those who stepped in to help. Always nice to hear about a great outcome. Um, and John makes a comment here that is probably very, very valid as well. First aid should be a standard course in all schools, maybe every even year for them, grades two, four, six. Start with small steps like what to do in an emergency and minor things as they grow, uh, get them more competent. The world would be a better place. Yeah, and Kevin, this goes to, I guess, early real life training that could be instituted in certain situations in uh, in our school system given the resources and uh, and the opportunity and the money and all the rest of it to do those things that would, there's a lot of things that would be good to do that to uh, kind of fall off the table but considering the fact that uh, things like CPR and early warnings and uh, re being able to recognize the signs of stroke and you know all of these all of these things that uh, that are out there um, it's always good to know more than less and, and, and learn it earlier than, than later. Even, even, a, even a young child uh, that, I mean, everybody grows up with a phone in their hand. Even, even a young child that knows how to hit an emergency button on a cell phone, just anything like that. You don't know who it's going to save or when. I couldn't agree more, Lee. Uh, my wife and I, just as we were about to have children, looked into taking CPR courses and it's it's not easy like you got to jump through hoops to learn life-saving techniques and I agree it should be taught in schools it's very valuable it used to, it used to be a very very simple thing I, I think I know like a, a lot of us think we know but but I don't know when I lived in Penticton British Columbia I was on the board uh, of St. John's Ambulance Company uh, and and that was uh, that was always one of the things that we discussed uh, often as to how to get this information into the hands of everyone as early as possible and information that was actionable. You know, not the uh, not not the the really not a pamphlet. Uh, not a yeah, yeah. 
Some, something that was, as that, as that gentleman alluded to in their post, something that is suitable for their age. You know, like, you, don't ex you don't expect a, a six or seven year old to start doing um, CPR on somebody, but to be able to know whom to call or how to react and, you know, and to do these kinds of things. Um, and uh, yeah, sure, parents are a part of it, but I think schools probably. No, it's a, it it kind of goes to that meme that's circling this time of year. You know, thank, I want to thank my, uh, you know, my elementary school geometry teacher because, uh, you know, all those shapes are really helping during this parallelogram season. <laughs> and it's so true, right? I mean, they don't, I they don't teach you how to do your taxes, and yet as we grow into adulthood, yeah. and, and this is a, you know, a life-saving technique yeah. that you never know when you're going to have to employ. You think that Canada would be a better country if we all knew it. Do I mean, you know, I don't think we're sinking if we don't know parallelograms, but CPR, we should all know that. Do you know that there are very, very few people below a certain age that even know how to send a letter, where to put the stamp, or, or a return address if there is such a thing, or like, I wonder. Why would they? Yeah. <laughs> so why is my mail still being delivered door to door? Every day. Every day. I have no clue. Why, why is that? And post, I'm, so, I'm sorry, posties, but... Po I, I was just going to say the same thing. I really apologize to the posties that walk around carrying those big bags that are delivering me flyers and junk mail. I don't want to see you get out of a job, but, but why am I getting this stuff? Honestly, I really don't I want another A&W burger. I, can, I know where the A&W is if, if, I, if I want one. I could uh, cut the workforce in half. Here's an idea. Just deliver me my mail once a week. Yeah. I'm fine with that. They pick up my garbage once a week. You know what? Do it on the same day so I could just take my mail and put it right in the recycling. All the important bucket. stuff that keeps my gas coming, my electricity coming, uh, my, my, uh, my, my bank uh, still uh, liquid, all that stuff comes on this guy right there. I don't, I don't need any, like all my banking information, like everything. The only thing, the only thing that's necessary that they don't send uh, are the government's checks. You don't get, you don't, you, you, you don't get your, uh, like when I got my, the, the refund for the license sticker thing, that came snail mail. Uh, stuff from Canada Revenue Agency comes snail mail because they think it's still the most secure thing. I don't know why, but I, I don't, I, but nobody knows. My point being, nobody teaches a kid how to put a stamp on an envelope. What is a stamp anyway? Why do we have stamp? Like, nobody tells them this, but they do know the parallelogram theory. <laughs> Oh man, uh, Lee, I got a couple Don't of stories we have here. Fun here. Not sure if you got if you got something of where uh, where you want to go here. No, no, fine. Of, I'm I'm wide open, Kevin. A couple of four one one stories. I don't want to end on on a down note, but um, but, but I, I know there's, there's the but. Yeah, hearts are breaking for this family. When I read this story, I said, "Oh my God!" And this happened on Sunday. Uh, you know, Sunday, ten fifteen p.m. Single vehicle collision in Fort Erie. It was a I think it was a car into a fire hydrant, and unfortunately, a 19-year-old girl was pronounced deceased at the scene. And you know that a, a family just absolutely... 19-year-old male, it Oh, says. sorry. 19-year-old male just absolutely torn apart. Torn apart by this. Identity of the driver not being released. Detectives assigned to the collision reconstruction unit are appealing to members of the public as to uh, any information, of course. And then there was in, in Wellenly, and the, the comments, and, and you know, people that uh, are part of Niagara 411 know sometimes that the comments is where the story comes alive. Mm -hmm. And this is NRP making a, um, making a homicide arrest in Welland. And this was 11.40 uh, p.m. the night prior, this past Saturday. 20 to 12, Saturday night. Upon arrival, police located three individuals, two with significant injuries, Oh, yes, I remember this story. One male pronounced deceased at the scene while the second victim was transported to a local hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The suspect was located at the scene and placed under arrest by uniform. Officers, 33-year-old Joel Drever, has been arrested and charged with second-degree murder, aggravated assault, assaulting police, two counts of that. He's currently being held in custody pending a bail hearing. 
and Sunday, May the 1st. 2022 at John Speaker Courthouse in the city of Hamilton. So, if, well, goodbye to that life. There you go. So, if you look into the comments, um, you know, a lot of people knew this guy, Joel. A lot of people grew up with Joel, and a lot of people um, kind of implying that Joel has dealt with maybe addiction issues, with uh, mental health issues, and never really received the, the kind of attention. Yeah, the kind of attention. And it, um, you know, I mean, here's Travis saying he had a really hard upbringing. And struggled with addiction, mental illness. This has nothing to do with all the other stuff that has been happening in the city. He stayed with the victim to surrender himself. He was probably so in shock, and the assault to the officers was due to something in him snapping. He was very mentally ill, and unfortunately, stuff like this happens. His mind was gone when all of this happened. It's unfortunate that someone died. But he probably hey, oh, hates sorry. himself for it. But, uh, yeah, um... And I mean, oh, you know, man, it, it that is sad. This is so sad. Joel suffers from mental illness and has fallen through the cracks of the medical system. There are other people commenting about, um, you know, here's a guy sad. I went to school with Joel in elementary and high school. He was quiet and artistic. Wow. I mean, ev everybody's got a story, but this one just struck a, struck a nerve with me because there was such yeah. an outpouring of support for, you know, Joel. The Joel sadness of the situation. Yeah, he's not the type of guy that would ever want this to happen. Nobody it, it was trying to defend the fact that, that he did this. And I go, you know, alleged at this point, but nobody was trying to just say trying that. To just, just, that. just trying to paint a tapestry of what was behind it. Wow. Well, there, there are some sad, sad people in our world, and hopefully, hopefully he'll, it'll be too late for his victims that he never intended to be victims by the sounds of it, but hopefully he'll get the help now that he deserves, but it's a couple of people too late. Um, I want to thank, again, our sponsors of the program, Gales Gas Bars, for, uh, for fueling this program uh, as they have for, uh, well, almost from its inception now. And uh, so we thank them for that. There, see that rainbow, uh, that rainbow logo there at the top of that uh, that post. The um, LGBT plus recognized and uh, what is the, what is the proper word, Kevin? Uh, rainbow registered business. Thank you. Uh, it just flew out of my head. That's why I keep the hat on so things don't do that. But it doesn't always work. Rainbow registered business scales gas bars. Uh, congratulations on that and many of your other achievements. Performance Heating and Air, Carlo, thank you. Verge Insurance Group, uh, Mark Shirk and, uh, and the gang, appreciate your support as always. Nick at Niagara 411, thanks. Nick's mom also. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all of the moms. Um, Kevin, it's been nice to see your mom from time to time and I know you're going to see her over the weekend, so uh, give her my best. Um, and uh, may the 4th be with you. It's the only time it works if you have a speech impediment. May the 4th be with you. Um, now, Kevin, we often, well, not often, every week have... Uh, oh, thanks, everybody, too, for adjusting to this uh, new day. If you did indeed uh, adjust to this new day, we occasionally, because of some conflicting events that uh, WeStream uh, has... Uh, and, of course, they're running a business as well, Kevin and Brandon Scram and uh, all the rest of it. You can't be in two places at once, so occasionally we end up having to move this show, and we always appreciate Fiddler's Poorhouse for, uh, for allowing us to squeeze in whenever, whenever we, we need to. So, uh, so thanks for that, and also thanks to Kevin for, again, producing this program. Uh, thank you to Beau Chapeau for uh, cooperating with me and my chapeaus on a, on a weekly basis as well. Well, we do, as I was saying before I w so rudely interrupted myself, has, uh, we always have a musical guest to play us off the stage. Now, uh, I am blissfully unaware of who that musical guest is going to be today, Kevin. And the thing is, Lee, as of right now, I'm also blissfully unaware. <laughs> I'm searching my local socials, uh, but it's a good time to remind people that if you are part of a band, and what we're really looking for is, um, is polished, produced music videos. And for example, um, like Helix just released a band. Helix doesn't need our help. 
Uh, no. We're looking for you know local musicians. You know what I'll do? I'll dig up um, one of uh, one of my favorite songs from Jess Wilson. Sure. And let's play that because we love Jess. She's been all over the place. Sure. Let's see if I can find out where she's going to be. She's just such a sweet girl. Yeah. And um, and again, just just let us know uh, if you know of a, a band. And as long as they've got a video, because of course this is a, a visual medium that we that we work with here. I also want to mention to you uh, the fact that if you aren't able to watch the entire program on a day such as this where we are on from noon until 1.30 ish uh, every week, normally our time is Thursday from noon to 1.30, I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks. I got to go uh, visit the grandbabies in, uh, in British Columbia and my sons as well, the babies and the grandbabies. <laughs> uh, so uh, for the next couple of weeks we will have a, a, a fill-in host here on Niagara 411 Live with Lee Terry. There'll be guest hosts, um, uh, Bree... Bree Watson. Watson. And she's from uh, Improv Niagara. We met her about two or three weeks ago right here on the show, and she's yeah. going to be uh, sitting in that chair, Lee, uh, for two consecutive Thursdays. Two so consecutive the 12th Thursdays, yeah. And the 19th. Yeah, so uh, assuming... assuming uh, that she's going to do a great job. Uh, I may or may not be back uh, in week three. I could be displaced. You never know. Uh, but anyway, we wish her uh, yeah, break a leg, Brie. Uh, great gal, and she's uh, she's going to do just fine and have have fun with you and uh, and her group. So, and we'll see you in uh, about three weeks' time. Now, Lee, I'll throw up here for uh, fans of Jessica Wilson, and I'm a big fan. Uh, she says she's playing one of her last shows in Niagara for some time, and it's going to be this Sunday, or sorry, this Saturday in Fawn Hill. Oh, great. Well, it's a good a timely thing to put this up there, then. Bring on the spring weather. $5 domestic pints are on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Jess Wilson uh, is, uh, is coming up here. Kevin's going to pick a, pick a piece. She will play us off the stage. I do want to thank Amy and Keith of Freak Show Comics for being on the program today, um, suffered a, a, a real loss in the break into their uh, their shop on Lundy's Lane in Niagara Falls, $20,000 plus worth of merchandise. And it was a very specialized merchandise, so I'm fingers crossed that uh, they'll make some progress in finding out who these people were and where that stuff went so they can hopefully get their material back. I really hope that happens. Free comic book day at the shop. Check it out. Freak Show Comics, Lundy's Lane, Niagara Falls. Um, not too far from like where Main and Ferry um, intersect, so uh, you get yourself a free comic book, have some fun and uh, some great See that deals. Guy out there is this where Niagara Four One One the show is? Yeah, he's right in there. Uh, look that at us. Go guy. Jays, go Jays. At least Terry guy must be right in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, have free, uh, have a nice uh, free comic book day on uh, on the seventh. Natalie Bebo, uh, originally of uh, Welland. Um, Director extraordinaire, world renowned. Don't forget the unsolved murder of Beverly Lynn Smith is going to be airing on Amazon Prime as of Friday morning. When you get up and have your breakfast on Friday and you want to access Amazon Prime, that documentary will be there about an unsolved uh, murder going back uh, into the 70s from the Oshawa area and. Uh, Natalie, once again, superb work on that. So, congratulations, and thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show. What a great, what a great lady she is. So, so down to earth and uh, and open with her comments, and just, uh, just, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful talent, and a and a great spokesperson and uh, role model for for Niagarans, especially females in Niagara. That sees, uh, you know, all you got to do is dream it. And you can make it happen. Kevin Jack, uh, we stream Canada's uh, premier streaming company. Uh, always a pleasure to work with you. I hope you enjoy the next couple of weeks with Bree. And uh, I guess we're going to take you out with Jess Wilson. Have yourself a fabulous weekend, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to the moms. And uh, I miss you, Mom. Uh, you were the best. Cheers. Cheers.